Um, and I want to start out by asking a question. Uh, my birthday was like a week and a half ago. And I was, thanks. Uh, and I was thinking through uh, things and birthdays over time. And I remember uh, Space Jam. Okay. How many of you guys have seen the original Space Jam movie? Like, the, not the LeBron one. I love LeBron James, but like, the, the, that's the lesser one, okay? Uh, the Michael Jordan, like, came out in 1996, Space Jam, okay? And the reason I remember is because Space Jam came out on my birthday. Like, it came out November 15th, 1996. And I remember, and you, all the students are like, you are so old. Um, I remember coming and going to the Genito Cinema 9, okay? It's right behind Mr. Pepe. It's like a church or something now, but that was the movie theater. And I remember going with our family to see Space Jam on my birthday in 1996. And this movie, if you haven't seen it, I wanna give you like a, a real quick like synopsis, okay? So this movie starts out and you have these aliens, okay? And they have a space theme park. And sometimes I think, how did 90s movies get made? Like, because the concept is just completely foreign. But they had a space theme park that was going under and they decided to abduct the Looney Tunes to be a new um, act for their theme park, okay? And so these aliens come down from space looking like this to meet the Looney Tunes and take them to their leader, okay? And the Looney Tunes convince them that they need a chance to defend themselves. And so they convince them to challenge and play a game of basketball. Now, when you're looking at these little aliens, it seems like that's a good idea. Like they look pretty unathletic, pretty like uncoordinated. Like it seems like a pretty fair bet the Looney Tunes are gonna win. But what they don't realize is that these aliens have the ability to take the talent of NBA basketball players. And so the aliens go to various NBA games and steal uh, talent from players who were very big at the time, like Patrick Ewing and Charles Barkley, okay? Guys who are now announcing NBA games. But back then they were really good. So they stole their talent and they show up to Toonland one day looking like this, okay? Little aliens aren't so little anymore. And they called themselves, does anyone remember the name of the team? The Monstars, okay? They were the Monstars. And you had the Toon Squad versus the Monstars. Now, when they showed up, the Looney Tunes obviously look and they go, well, we are at a huge disadvantage. Where we thought we were advantaged, now we are disadvantaged. And so what do they do? They go and they kidnap Michael Jordan. Okay, they pull him through a golf hole with a lasso and bring him to Toonland. And Michael Jordan at the time was retired and they convince him that in all the things that he's doing, it's very important that he come and help the Looney Tunes win a basketball game. And so him and Bill Murray go to try and help save the Looney Tunes. Now the game takes place and here's the thing where the odds were completely stacked against them, they have the best player in the world on their team. Like this is Michael Jordan after three championships, he's gonna go and he's gonna win another three. He's won multiple MVPs. People are singing songs like, like Mike and talking about how they wanna be like Mike. We still buy Jordan shoes. Like there are Jordan branded sports teams. Like this guy was the best player on the entire planet. And even though the odds look completely insurmountable, like they have the best player in the world on their team. And that brings them some level of confidence. And the game starts out rough and it doesn't go well. And Michael like convinces them that they're gonna be okay. And, and they go out and they play the second half and spoiler alert, like 30 years later, they win the game, okay? Michael like stretches his arm from half court and like dunks the ball to win and the Looney Tunes are all free, okay? Um, but here's the thing. A lot of us walk through our life without the confidence of knowing that we have the best player on our team. 
We live our faith in such a way that like, it's easy to have confidence when everything is easy. It's easy to have confidence at your job when you've been there a few years and you just kind of know how everything works. It's easy to have confidence for a test that you've studied for, and I'm sure all of you study really, really hard for all of your tests. <laughs> it's easy to have confidence when everything is just right. It's a whole lot harder to have confidence when you start uh, facing obstacles. And a lot of us in our faith, we walk through our faith believing that God has great plans for us. And then when people come and face us with opposition, we forget who we are and whose we are. We forget that we have the best player on our team fighting for us. And even in the midst of obstacles, like we still have someone who can overcome even the biggest of obstacles. And so John has been writing this book that we've been going through over the last few weeks called First John. And he's writing to these Christians and these believers who are tired and beat down and just don't see light at the end of the tunnel. And I want you to know that when you feel like the worry is just mounting up and as people come and they question your faith and you kind of back off and shrink away because you don't have an answer, one, you're not alone. This problem dates way, way, way back in time. But two, you can have confidence. See, I uh, am a super competitive person. And I always look for ways to find confidence. When I was in speech class, I would go last. Why? So I could watch everyone else and know how I could beat them, right? But we have confidence in something that's so much bigger than that. And so John is writing to these people who just completely lack confidence or getting ready to walk away from their faith. And in week one, we talked about walking in the light. And we looked at a verse that said this. It said, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And we said that when light shows up in a dark room, it's noticeable. Like when Jesus shows up in our life, people take note of what we are doing and who we are and what God is doing through us. And we said when we walk in the light, people are looking for the light that we have. And then in week two, we talked about walking the talk and backing up the things that we say with our actions in our life because it's not enough to just say it, we have to be about it. And so the verse that kind of shaped this whole series was this one in, in 2 verse 6, and it says, the one who says he remains in him should walk just as Jesus walked. And we can't just be about words, we have to be about faith and about actions and about deeds. And we have to live out the love of Jesus, not just talk about the love of Jesus. And then last week we parked ourselves in a word, abide. And we said, we've got to walk in the truth. And if we want to follow Jesus, we've got to plant ourselves in his truth and follow his path. We've got to dwell in the things that he has for us. We've got to go in the direction that he wants for us and not in whatever direction we see fit for our life because we've tried it and it didn't work. And so through this series, we've been looking at what it looks like to walk with Jesus. And the thing is, it's really hard sometimes. And John is going, you need to do this, you need to do this and stay on the course and do all the right things. But then this week he shifts gears a little bit and he says, look, there is something that we can rest in if we walk with Jesus. And so he starts, and we're gonna start in chapter four of 1 John, and it says this. It says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. I love this verse for this reason. He says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God. He doesn't say, hey, you have to get all your life together. Hey, you have to figure all these things out. Hey, you have to have a Bible degree. Or if you're gonna walk with Jesus, you better have good walking shoes because the path is not really uh, always paved. He goes, look, whoever confesses, See, there are no uh, prerequisites to following Jesus other than that we just have to accept his invitation. 
So many of us live like we have to have all our ducks in a row before Jesus will ever accept us. And Jesus goes, I didn't come and die for you because you had it figured out already. I came and died for you because there was no way you could figure it out on your own. You just have to accept the invitation. When Jesus calls his disciples, these guys that are going to walk with him for three years and just do ministry with him, like when Jesus calls them and he walks up to the shore and calls fishermen who are getting off a boat after a day of work, he doesn't look at them and say, hey, like you need to finish your job. You need to go and memorize the Torah and then you can come and follow me. He says, come and follow me. And they drop what they're doing and they go. That's it. So many of us put so many things, well, I need to get this. I need to make sure my 401k is funded. I need to make sure my family is solid. And then I'll start figuring everything else out. Then Jesus will accept me. But you don't know all the things that I've got to get figured out first. And Jesus says, that's not what this is about. This sounds an awful lot like a verse that John wrote that probably all of us have heard before. A lot of us have probably memorized It's this one, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then he says this, he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John writes this at the beginning of his ministry when he's walking with Jesus, and John writes this again at the end of his ministry when he's 80 and getting ready to pass away, and I want you to know this. John has watched all of his friends who followed Jesus with him get brutally killed in the name of Jesus. John has watched all of his best friends, the people that he did life with when he was walking with Jesus, get just tortured for their faith, and he goes, you know what? God died for me, and he died for the people who were killing my friends too. And he writes this at the beginning of his ministry, and he writes it right at the end of his ministry. He goes, look, whoever comes to him, whoever believes in him, they will be saved. And he says, look, Jesus wasn't sent here to condemn us and to tell us all the things that we've done wrong and lay the hammer on us and go, I'm here to press judgment now. He says, He's come to provide a way out. Because there's no way that we can provide our own way out. It's like trying to put toothpaste back in a tube. Like you can try really, really hard, but it's never going to happen. And he said, God didn't send his son to, you know, come and condemn everyone. He sent him to provide us a way out because we messed it up too bad to the point where we can't fix it ourselves. And just like a parent steps in to help their kid when they can't do it, Jesus comes to save us because we can't do it on our own. He came to provide us a way out. And then John continues on and he says this, and he says, and we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. And I want you to understand this. Like when John got called by Jesus, he didn't know Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He might've known, you know, some of the things he had done. But this passage says he has come to know and believe. Like as he walked with Jesus and as he saw him do all the things that he said he was going to do. And as he saw that Jesus proved himself time and time and time again. He said, look, I knew Jesus, but now I know Jesus. And I've come to believe, and this believe is a word that means fully convinced of. He goes, I am fully convinced that Jesus is is who he says he was and will do what he says he will do, and he fulfills all of his promises because that's who Jesus is. See, here's the thing. My wife and I have been married. It'll be 13 years in, uh, in January. We have a picture. For all of those who were saying I should shave my beard, here's, here's what it looks like. But all the hair went from here to here, and it's not going back up here, so it's not going away from here. But here's the thing. Alicia and I's story is different than a lot of people. Uh, we started talking okay, whatever that means, Uh, in November of 2009. We went on our first official date, or we started dating and went on our first official date the week of January 1st of 2010. 
I proposed to her April 10th of 2010. We were married January 1st of 2011 at one o'clock. That's a very crazy fast timeline. I get it. None of you do that, okay? <laughs> at least not now. Wait till you're getting ready to graduate college because that's where we were. But here's the thing. Three months in, I knew that I loved Alicia and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her and she was beautiful inside and out and her character and everything, like her values and my values aligned, what we wanted for our life aligned. I knew all those things three months in. But over the last 13 years, I have come to know her so much more than I knew her when we said I do on January 1st, 2011. Over 13 years, I have learned that my wife, if my, my family was watching this on Thanksgiving, my wife is the kind of woman that when you give her a piece of bread and something to spread on it, she will spread it all the way to the very edge and it will be as even as physically possible because she wants the perfect bite every single time. That is something I've learned over the 13 years. I've also learned that my wife follows the rules to the T. Board games, she has made me lose so many board games because she's like, well, that's not in the rules. And then I lose. On my birthday last year, <laughs> I told her, I will, you will never live that down. But I've also learned that my wife's the kind of person that if you give her a task, she is going to learn it quickly and she is going to be excellent at it because that's who she is. Those are all things that I didn't know 13 years ago but I knew her character and I knew who she was. And just like John says, I know Jesus now after all these years of his ministry, it's the same thing about me and my wife is as you spend time, as you walk with someone, you become more and more convinced of who they are. And John looks at Jesus and he says, I've walked with him, I've seen him, and I've watched him in my ministry after Jesus left. I have seen him work time and time and time again. And I have confidence because he is who he says that he is. And so then he goes on and he says, God is love. And we've talked about love every single week and this is why. He says, God is love and the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. And in this love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. We've talked about love every week. It wouldn't be a book written by John if we didn't talk about love. But he says, look, God is love. If you think you understand love here, our love here pales in comparison to the love that God has for you. There is nothing that you can do to separate you from the love of God. And John says, because of this love and because of who Jesus is and because he has come and blazed a trail for us, if we abide in his truth, then we can walk in confidence. We can walk in confidence because he has already paid the price for us. And no matter how difficult and hard things are in our life, he has already written the script. We already know how it ends. It's just like a WWE match. You may be in the ring and things may be a little bit unpredictable and you may end up through a table, but we know who wins in the end because the script is already written. God does not fail. He knows the plan. He knows where you're going. And even when we are on the path and things don't make sense, he goes, just trust me. And if you abide here and you walk with me, I already know where the end is, even if you can't see it right now. And I want to tell you something. I said that Alicia and I have been married for almost 13 years. And when we started dating, we started having conversations about going into the ministry because I knew that's what God was calling me into. 
And I knew that I was gonna go and I didn't know where we were gonna live, but I knew that God wanted me in the ministry. And so I told her, I said, look, this is what we're doing. Um, I need you to be on board with that if we're gonna date, like, cause that's, that's where we're going. And that was her degree too. Her degree was in youth and Bible. And so right after we got married, uh, we looked for our first ministry and we got in and we just dove in head first. And God was doing so many things, like we were seeing students showing up in the morning to bring their Bible and read across a table with us at, at a McDonald's. We were watching students show up to see you at the pole. We were watching all these students lead and come to know Jesus more and more. But ministry is hard. And there were times that I sat there and thought, no one told me it was gonna be like this. No one told me that in the first eight years of our marriage, we would live in five different states and in 11 different houses. No one told me that when I would go into ministry and pour my heart out, looking to see the next generation change and pouring into kids and just going, you know, God, I want you to use me and use Alicia and we just want to see lives changed. No one told me that the same people that would be right next to us on a Sunday would stab us on the back, in the back on a Wednesday. And there were so many times that I would sit or lay on my bed and write in my journal and just cry. And I'd say, God, I know this is what you want me to do. And I know you brought me here and it's completely evident that this is the path that you want. And I don't understand why it's so hard right now. I remember one morning when we were living in Florida, I was sitting in a chair, our, our second kid had just been born. And I was just sitting in this chair crying like hot, Tears, Like I, I couldn't talk. I couldn't even explain to you what was going through my head. And I was just sitting and I was just bawling. And Alicia comes out and sees me. And I'm like, as much as I cry up here, like this is not normal. And I'm sitting in this chair and I'm just bawling. And she says, are you okay? And I had no words. And I'm just sitting there just hurting. And I just was thinking, God, why is this so difficult? I remember sitting at a table with my dad and he was a youth pastor that went through the same kind of stuff. And I remember him one week telling me, you don't have to fail because I failed. And here I am just feeling exactly like these people in this book were just speed up and just like, there's nowhere to go from here. In 2019, we moved back to Virginia after just being let go one, one random Monday. The pastor brought me in with no warning and said, you're done here and fired me. And I had no idea what God was gonna do next. I said, we just need to move back home and we'll just figure it out. And I thought ministry was done. And in 2019, there is no way that I could have seen myself standing on a stage on staff here, preaching God's word to you and telling you not to give up. I didn't see it, but God saw it. He knew so much more than I did and never, <laughs> never did I expect that I would be here again. But when you know and you trust God, no matter how difficult life is, no matter how much people will let you down, Jesus gives us confidence because he never fails. And I can look back over the entirety of my life and I can see how God proved himself again and again and again. And I know that John at 80 years old is looking at his life and going, I've seen this and I've seen this and I've seen this. And as hard as it feels right now, don't quit. I'm so thankful for the path that God brought me to put me here. Cause it's not the path I would have picked. And so John goes on and he says this in chapter five. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. I love the idea of being a child because kids have different access to their parents than everyone else does. And he says, you're a child of God. You can come to your dad whenever you need something because they are there for you. 
And he says, and everyone who loves the father loves his children too. And we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. And then he goes on and says, loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. And I wanna tell you something. For everyone that says, oh, I, I wanna follow God, but I really wanna do this. And we look at God's commands as a burden when your desires match God's desires, his commands are exactly the things that you wanna be doing. It's only a burden when we go, no, I wanna do my own thing. And God goes, well, this is really what you need to be doing. But when we become more and more like Jesus, his commands become our desires and not our burdens. And he goes on, he says, for every child of God defeats the evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. He says, the world is going away. All the things that are fighting for our attention and trying to tell us that God is not worth it, all those things are going away, but Jesus never fails. And I want you to notice something, and this is a super powerful verse in 1 John chapter four, and it says this. It says, and who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the son of God. And then we'll go to the next verse, and it says this. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's not even comparable. I don't know where this idea came to me, but in the first service I said, it's like going to the Y and taking like your youngest little kids team and then putting LeBron James against them, right? he would just smack the ball out of the gym and just look at him like, what do you got, kid? Like, like, it is not even close to the same. Because greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world. All the things of the world are going away and Jesus never fails and is never going anywhere. And so this isn't even really a comparison. He's just saying, look, you have everything to be fully confident in because you have the best player on your team and there is nothing anyone else can do about it because they can try and he's just gonna take the game over. And then John ends the book of 1 John, and it's really rather abrupt, but I think it's just kind of a bow on everything that he's been saying, and he says this. He says, dear children, and he's used that phrase over and over and over again, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. He says, there are so many things that want to distract you and pull you away from who God wants you to be, but stay focused. Stay focused on what is right and true. He says, walk in the light and walk in truth and back up your talk with your actions. And when you walk with Jesus, you can walk in confidence because the path is already laid clear. And so here's the deal. All of us have steps that we need to take. And we have different people in this room at different places in their walk with Jesus. And so I just want to give you a couple steps. And the first one is this. Maybe today you just need to follow Jesus. Maybe today you've been trying to do your own thing. You've been trying to create your own path and it's gotten you nowhere really, really fast. And today, rather than trying to take control of the situation, maybe you just need to yield your life to God and say, I've tried to do it on my own and it's never worked out. And so God, can you just show me the direction I need to go? And I speak from experience that when you yield your life to God, as much as it may seem like you are out of control, I promise you he is fully in control. And he's much better at this than you are. Maybe you need to make the decision to be baptized. Because you followed Jesus, but then like, you're like, well, I don't wanna do that, and am I really that in? And I can't, I'm gonna tell you this, there is no like halfway in with Jesus. You're either all in or you're all out. And I wanna tell you something because this just happened to coincide with today. But last week, my son was in the car with my wife and he's nine. And he said, mom, I wanna be baptized. And we've had these conversations with him before and they'll kind of come up and go away. And he said, I wanna be baptized. And my wife said, well, what does that mean? And he started telling her about like, this is me being obedient to who God is in my life and I wanna follow him. And last night I was talking to him and I said, buddy, what does that mean? He said, Dad, I want to show all of the older people, no offense. He uses that word a lot. 
He said, I want to show all the older people that even someone like me can follow Jesus. He's nine. That kid is going to change the world. What are you waiting for? So many of us make excuses and we go, well, in the new year, I'll get things right. In the new year, I'll start reading my Bible. In the new year, I'll give my life to Jesus. And in the new year, and sometimes those next steps never come and we get to the new year and we go after this holiday and after this thing. But why are we waiting when the steps are right there and Jesus is waiting for you? You don't have to wait till January to start something that Jesus is calling you to right now. And maybe you've followed Jesus and maybe you've been baptized and maybe you need to take the next step and you need to get back on track because you made the decision and you made all the right choices and you started out real strong and things went sideways and you lost track of where God was taking you. And now you're way off the path and you don't know how to get back and maybe you need to bring some people alongside you and go, look, I just want to refocus where I'm going. And then maybe you're still on track But as we go into the Christmas season, you just need to stay focused. Because this is the time when so many things vie for our attention. And even though the season is supposed to be about Jesus, so many times we get off on anything but Jesus. And we get so wrapped up in the presents and the pageants and the movies and the music and everything else that we miss the point of the season. And so maybe you just need to pray for focus right now because you want to do anything other than the thing that we need to be doing most. Now look, we're going to end this series a little bit differently. Uh, When I started talking through this series with Kyle, our, our worship pastor, I said, look, there's this song, and as we're talking about walking in confidence, right? talking about walking in the confidence that God gives us. I said, there's this song, and it's called Champion, and we haven't sang it in church before, but you may have heard it. And this song says this, it says, you are my champion. And it says, giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. It's not about us, it's all about him. And then it says this, it says, I am who you say that I am. He gives you your value. You crown me with confidence and I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. And so we're gonna sing in just a minute and you can stand and sing. If you know the song, you can sing along with it. You can sit and you can just think. But I want you to realize that you are who God says you are. And he wants you to walk in the confidence that only he can give. And so when we sing together, I just pray that you would just just soak it in. And so we're gonna pray Um, and then the band will come forward and we're gonna sing, so let's pray. Father God, you, you give us confidence. God, you've laid the path out for us. You've called us to walk in your light and to back up our actions, our our walk with our actions, God. And, And you say, look, if you follow me, I have laid the path out for you. The ending is already written. And God, if we're here just questioning ourselves and questioning our faith and feeling like these people that John's writing to, we just feel beat up and like we're just too tired to go on. I pray that we would take strength knowing that you are our champion, that you fight the battle. And we stand in the confidence because you are the best player on the team. And we know that no matter what, you are there for us. God, help us to walk with you every day. In your name I pray, amen.
tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it But you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it You give what we don't deserve it Take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. Me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. You have, now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all of the striving cease Oh, cause this, this is my victory You are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you won I am who you say
step is today but I know every one of us no matter where we are in this journey with Jesus whether we've been following him for 30 years or 30 minutes all of us need to take a step because I will tell you and I talked to someone in between services and I said I love this about Jesus that no matter how long I follow him, there is always something new to know. And so I don't know what your step is today, but take a step. And as we walk into the holiday season, I pray that you would walk with your focus in the right place, knowing that he has got the script written and you can follow in confidence with him. 